board for the cloud. All right, everybody on Zoom, you guys can hear me okay? Somebody want to speak up or comment on chat? Yeah, I can hear yep. you. Yep. All right, thanks, Darius. Appreciate it. Yep. All right, thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, so let's get started because it's already 12.02 and it's a Friday and we've got some really cool stuff to cover today. So um, let me, where did my, how do I, there we go. I'll stop my video. Okay. Uh, homework five is due today at midnight. Hopefully you guys saw that on Gradescope. You should get it submitted. Any issues with submitting that? Oh, there were some issues. I posted a couple of announcements on Piazza. There was a bug in the Python and the C++ starter code. Not really a bug. I accidentally deleted part of the declaration in the C++ code. And I was using a tuple instead of a list for some of the Python code. So there are a few corrections there. The current starter code is correct. So if you are just starting on the homework, you won't have the issue. But if you copied it before yesterday, um, you need to fix a couple of lines of code, all right? Um, now, submitting on Gradescope, there has been an issue with the replet. When you download the zip file, it downloads empty uh, files. Like, they're, they're totally empty. If you try to submit to Gradescope, it'll give you an error. It'll say, like, zip is corrupted or something like that. Uh, at the end of the day, you only need to submit, if you're doing it in C++, you need to submit three files, answers.h, answers.cpp, and citations.txt, in case you reference outside material. Um, just submit those three files. However, you can get them to upload to Gridscope with the correct content. So if you go on Replit, you can download each file individually. Uh, that seems to work. Uh, I'm not sure if they fixed the zip issue. I did send them an email reporting a bug, but I have no like I don't know anybody at Replit, so I, I don't know how long that takes to fix. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it for homework five. So it's due tonight. Uh, there is no homework six this week because we have the midterm in class, in person, written midterm, around ten pages long. I just finished preparing the first draft. Um, it will be next Friday, OK? Uh, I added some information to the course website. So let's take a look there. Um, if you follow this link, you will see that uh, next week, uh, today is the last lecture that we'll, we'll cover content that might be on the midterm. So the content we're going to cover on Monday, we are going to cover new content. That is not going to be on the midterm. You're not responsible for that for the midterm. Um, on Wednesday, we're going to do a review session. So I encourage you guys to come prepared with questions for stuff you don't understand or stuff that's not clear. Um, and then on Friday, we're going to do the midterm 50 minutes during lecture in class. And then you guys will be off to spring break uh, while Chi and I have a little party and we grade your exams, hopefully that Friday, so I can get your grades back to you quickly. OK? Um, yeah, so what's covered? We're going to be covering lecture 0 through lecture 18. So I just talked about that. Homework 0 to homework 5, you are responsible for that content, OK? It's like you need to know that stuff, because homework 5 was due today. Uh, material from quiz 0 up to quiz 5. Quiz 5 is the one we took this Monday. Quiz 6 is the one we're going to take next Monday, covering this week, right? So basically, it's all the material up to this week, right, it's up to this Friday. Uh, I did also upload a practice midterm. So you guys can get a sense of what the midterm might look like. This may or may not be a little easier than the actual midterm. You know, we're still making tweaks to it. But this has, uh, I encourage you to do this practice midterm. So this is the basic format of what the midterm is going to look like. OK, we're going to have some stuff on asymptotic analysis. Basically, every module, all the stuff that we covered, there's going to be a few questions on that. Uh, most of the questions are going to be short answer, just written, like give me big O. OK, there's going to be a couple of multiple choice. There's going to be a couple where I ask you to fill in some pseudo code. So it does not have to be C++ code, et cetera. So definitely look through this. I think this gives you 29 practice questions. Uh, and it ends with graphs, which is the last thing we covered. So there is a practice midterm. So you use that to study and to figure out what you don't know. Uh, I did also post the solutions to the practice midterm. Um, but, you know, 
I think usually if you look at the solutions first, you might accidentally convince yourself that you know stuff that you don't actually know. So they are there, they're available. I would encourage you to try the midterm first, the practice one, see how you do, and then look at the solutions just to see, hey, what did I miss? What do I not understand? Okay. Um, I may release more practice midterms if this is not enough, but um, yeah, any questions on the midterm? No? Okay, great. Uh, another thing on the midterm, if you submitted all your homework and you submitted all your qu quizzes up to the stuff that's being covered in the midterm, I will give you a few small bonus points, okay? So just to help out all the people that are keeping up with all their work, if you have not submitted all the homework or all the quizzes, if you can make them up as per our policy, send them to me before I finish grading the midterm, which I think is, before I need to submit the grades for the midterm, which I think is March 16th, um, then you will also receive bonus points. Um, okay, so you have an opportunity up to March 16th to essentially make up all the work that we should have done up till now, right? Uh, and if you are in that situation where you're trying to make up work, just email me so we can figure out uh, what that makeup, what that's actually gonna look like. All right. Um, last piece is, uh, like I said, there's a meta EIR survey. Um, I'm actually going to give you guys two minutes right now. So again, this is optional. You don't have to fill it out. I do not see what your answers are. I do not know who you are. I do not know whether you fill it out or you don't fill it out. Uh, it should take two to three minutes. You don't have to fill it out right now, but... It would mean a lot to me if you did fill it out. So I am going to give you guys the next two minutes. If you want to, to take a look at that link right here. So it's a Google form, you just open it up. And if you are comfortable filling it out, no pressure, you don't have to, but I did wanna make a little bit of time for you to get the chance to fill it out. Um, yeah. All right, yeah. So we'll start lecture at 12.10. That also goes for you folks on Zoom. Again, uh, it is optional. You don't have to fill it out, but uh, it helps if you do. Even if you have bad things to say, you know, like it's fine. Yeah. Uh, I actually don't know what the survey looks like. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you, uh, I, I, I don't know if there's an other option. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you, uh, you can always suggest stuff. And again, even if you have like constructive feedback, which is like, Hey, I want him to do more of this or like whatever, like. I, I do not see them. I will not affect your grade. Uh, and I generally receive constructive feedback pretty well. So like, it's not like I'm gonna be sad or anything. Uh, so do feel free to like, you know, be as honest, as direct as you'd like. Okay. How's it going, Chi? So, I see you got your laptop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's video. That was changing. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's good. You should practice. Okay. Um, all right. Like I said, it is optional for you guys to fill it out. If you do fill it out, that would help out a lot. I think you can fill it out multiple times. I'm actually not sure. I don't know anything about the survey. I just wanted to remind you guys. But, um, you know, that is open until the middle of spring break. So you probably want to fill it out before you go on spring break. Um, but that's all right. So uh, let's go ahead and get started on lecture for today. So again, welcome to Comp285. Today we are going to be covering uh, connected components. All right. So this is 
one more application of depth first search is something that we call finding strongly connected components. We are going to define what that is in this lecture, and we are going to cover a linear time algorithm in the size of the graph to actually find the strongly connected components. It's a very clever algorithm. I do not expect you to be able to figure it out as we go through lecture, but I will be asking you questions to see if you can you know, make progress towards it. All right, so very briefly, since we're going back to depth first search, right? If you guys remember, last lecture we covered breadth first search, now we're going back to depth first search. Let's do a little bit of review. Let's briefly recap. Okay, so recalling depth first search, okay? Now, originally when we covered depth first search, I actually gave you an example on an, undirect, an undirected graph. So what is the difference between a directed and an undirected graph? Somebody wanna? Remind me, yeah, Lester. Yeah, uh, yeah. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna all all the graphs that we're gonna cover today in lecture are gonna be directed. All right, just so you guys know. And who wants to walk me through what DFS might look like in this graph? Let's say I start here where I am, and let's say that I break ties by picking the smaller uh, value. Or, oh, I didn't, I didn't cover. Yes, who wants to walk me through this? Should be pretty. So I start here, I'm doing depth first search and I'm gonna break ties by picking the smaller value. So if I have multiple possible choices I can go to, I'll pick the smaller node. Uh, yeah, look, start with one, you go to three, okay. Then we go to four, yep. Okay, then eight, yep. Okay, you stop, who wants to keep going? Where do I go next? Yeah. Okay, we go back to four. Okay, back to three, back to one. Okay. Okay, then we go to five. Uh, oh, this edge is not, uh, let's say the edge has an edge to two. Uh, actually, yeah, let's, Let's say it has an edge to two. Okay, then we go to two. Okay. Right, so three and four are already searched, so I go back to five, okay. Then we go to seven, great. Eight's already searched, yes, okay. Go back to five. Back to two, okay. Uh, wait, no, uh, do we go back to two? Actually, I think we go back to, to one because we came, we went from one to five, right? Yeah, this was, this is going out. So we go back to one, okay. Yeah, so we actually never got to six, why? There, there's no there's no arrows going to six. So if you were trying to explore the whole graph, you could actually imagine that you run DFS starting at one node, right? And what's going to happen is for any nodes you didn't get to, you run DFS starting at some node, right? So the only one we didn't get to, we run it again starting at six, right? Yeah. Um. Is this graph acyclic? Uh, this graph is, it's a little hard to tell whether it's acyclic or not, I'm not sure. But a cycle would be, can you follow a path that brings you back to where you started? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, if there was an edge from one to six, that would definitely create, uh, actually no, because there's no way to get back to one. There's no edge pointing into one. So actually, at least there's no cycle starting at one, because for the, for a node to be in a cycle, it has to have a, an edge pointing in and an edge pointing out, right? So at least for the no no cycle has one in it, but there may be other cycles. Like I think, I feel like, yeah, there there might be something there. That's a good question. All right, so that's great. 
Um, uh, whew. Uh, in this graph, uh, this one does have cycles. So again, if we walk to the DFS, we would start here. We set our current time to zero. And this is just going to be one example. So again, between nodes, it's arbitrary how you break up the ties, right? In an exam, I'll probably give you some way to break it up, but normally it's arbitrary. So what we're going to do here is maybe we go down this way. We set the start time to one. Then we go this way, set the start time to two, this way to three, this way to four. Then we back up because we're finished with that one. There's nowhere to go, right? We go back to three. Uh, we can go up to this node. So now that start time is six. And then from here, uh, there's actually nowhere to go because we've already been to this node. So we mark it as done. We set the finish time or the leave time as seven. We go back to three. Now this one becomes done because there's nowhere to go that we haven't been to. So the leave time is eight. We go back to two. This one is also done at this point, right? There's no other outgoing edges. Leave time is nine. Then we go back to this one. Leave time is 10. We go back to the beginning. And there's only one node left to explore, which is over here. Start time 11, leave time 12. Okay, so you should feel comfortable running through an example of that first search in the graph. All right. Any questions on this? Do you guys remember this? Just review, just rem remembering from two lectures ago. Okay, so that is how you explore a graph using that first search. Okay. Again, a little bit of review. If you guys remember, this creates what we call a DFS tree. Right, so the edges that we took become, if you look at those, if you pick up the graph from here, from where you started, and you look at just the edges you took, that actually defines a tree on your graph. There's a similar tree defined for BFS, right? And again, the reason, can you guys remind me why is this a tree? There's no cycles, right? So a complete, so a connected graph with no cycles is a tree, okay? Um, and the reason there's no cycles is because in our pseudocode for both DFS and DFS, we always check to make sure that we don't go back to a place we've already been to, right? Yeah. DFS, yes. Both of them have a, uh, they both define a tree, a corresponding tree, uh, which is just which edges that they take. The trees are different, uh, but they both define a tree. Okay, um, so if you can't reach everything, which we actually saw as an example at the very beginning, then what you would do is you would first run DFS on some node and you would mark all the nodes you were able to reach, okay? And then you essentially have an outer loop, which is checking to see, okay, are there any nodes I didn't get to reach? And let me run DFS from any of them and see what can I reach, okay? You would essentially start another DFS, let's say at H, and then you would finish exploring that. So if you can't reach everything, you run DFS repeatedly until all the nodes have been marked as visited. All right. Does this change the running time of DF? Like, does this change the running time or the amount of? No, it does not. Right. It should be like you guys should have an idea. It should be very easy for you to keep track of which nodes you haven't been to yet or finding them, okay? Even if you can't find it, iterating once over the graph is still linear. So you should be able to find it. Now, what this happens is you can imagine that at each point where you started DFS, if you pick up the graph from that point, that defines two separate trees. Um, this edge is kind of, this edge, uh, yeah, this happens all the time. Uh, I think this edge was supposed to be here or something. Just ignore it for now. But if you do pick it up, then you have a tree for the first run of DFS, and you also define another DFS tree for the second time you run it, OK? This is called a depth first forest, because you have a lot of trees. There is an equivalent breadth first forest, you guys can imagine. Because similarly, if you run breadth first search and you don't reach everything, because they're not, there's no way to get to them. You would just run breadth first search again from a node you haven't seen. Okay. All right. Something else that I want you guys to recall, because this is going to be helpful in today's lecture, is we actually covered these cases. Can somebody remind me what these cases we're trying to cover?
Yeah. So that's three cases where we're essentially what we were trying to prove is that the finish time, if there's an edge from node, let's say V to W, we were trying to show that if that edge exists, then no matter where we run DFS from, the finish time of W is going to be after the finish time, uh, or it's going to be greater than the finish time of V, right? And this is how we did topological sorting. You guys remember how we figured out how to sort the graph in order? Now, the only thing here is this still applies when you have a DFS forest, okay? Mainly because everything falls into this last case. So for these first two cases, they're within the same tree. So everything is still the same, the same argument that we did two lectures ago, you would do here. And then for this very last case, that was the argument where the two nodes were not related to each other. They were neither child nor parent. Um, and that also applies if the nodes are in different trees, okay? All right, so enough of review. Hopefully you guys remember that because we're gonna use it today. Now we're gonna cover something called strongly connected components, which is actually very useful for exploring the structure of graphs. And as you guys remember, graphs are everywhere. Okay, so this is actually a very useful algorithm. Uh, Google search uses this, Facebook uses this. They all have implementations of this algorithm internally for many, many of their graphs. Pinterest, yeah. All right, so a strongly connected component in a directed graph. So we say that a directed graph G is strongly connected, okay? If for every single pair of nodes, V and W, there is a path from V to W. So it does not mean that V and W are connected. It does not mean there's an edge between them. If for every single pair of nodes, there's an edge between them, what do we call that? I've actually mentioned it a few times, but I never explicitly called it out. Very subtle. It's called a complete graph. So if you, because then you have all possible edges. So it's called a complete graph. Uh, this is different. This is a strongly connected graph because there does not need to be an edge from V to W, but there needs to be a path from V to W. And there needs to be a path from W to V, right? So strongly connected basically means that from any pair of nodes, they can get between each other some way, right? It doesn't have to be direct, but there is some way to get between them. This also means that there's, uh, there's cycles everywhere, basically. Oh, so this is an example of a strongly connected component. Obviously for these two nodes, you can get between them, but you can see that between this node and this node, you can go this way to get from V to W, and you can go this way to get from W to V. And for any pair, you can get between them, okay? In both directions. That is what it means for a strongly connected component in a directed graph. What do you guys think is the definition for a strongly connected component in an undirected graph? Yeah. Yeah, you can imagine it's the exact same definition, except you don't actually need the second part. Because if it's undirected and there's a path from V to W, then that same path takes you back, right? This is an example of not strongly connected. Pretty obvious for these because they're disconnected. But this, uh, yeah, I did. the edges moved around. Let's, let's forget about that. You can imagine that you can have a graph that looks connected but there are some nodes you can't reach from one to the other, okay? Uh, I think the first graph we saw is an example of that. All right, so if you have just a general graph, something that you can do is call the decomposition of the graph into strongly connected components. So every graph can be decomposed into individual components that are strongly connected. Why? What is, uh, what is a trivial decomposition? of any graph into strongly connected components. So again, a strongly connected, connected component is part of a graph where from any node in that component to any other node in that component, you can get to it and then you can get back. 
why can every graph be decomposed into strongly connected components trivially? Yeah. Uh, actually, simpler than that. Simpler, simpler. Even a disconnected graph is technically, you can decompose it into strongly connected components. Because a, a single node by itself is strongly connected. Okay. So a trivial decomposition into strongly connected components would be just each individual node. Okay. But that's not generally we don't look for those. We're actually looking for like strongly connected components that are as large as possible. That's generally what we want. Okay. Uh, so let's do an example. Uh, if you're into the mathematical definition, these are called equivalence classes in the mathematical side of things. So you don't need to know that. But if you do math, then that might ring a bell to you. If not, then it's fine. All right, so why do we care about strongly connected components? Let's consider the internet, okay? So this is ncat.edu and uncg.edu. Do you guys have a rivalry with uncg? No, not at all. So I picked the wrong school. What, what school should I have picked to like make this more? Is there like a rivalry with like Howard or like what's what's like the school you guys compare yourself to? Oh, Salem. Okay, let's do Salem. Okay, I, I'll, I'll fix that for next iteration of this class. Okay, so if we consider the internet, you can imagine that you can form a graph, and this is actually the graph Google uses for their search. How do they rank your search results? They actually use a graph very similar to this, a lot more complicated, but similar to this, where each website is represented by a node. And then if you link from Wikipedia, if wikipedia.org has a link to NY Times, they have a directed edge going that way. Okay. So who can tell me what are the strongly connected components in this graph? The, the biggest ones, the biggest ones possible. Yeah. What one is the search for puppies and puppies? Okay, one is the search for puppies and the Google. Yeah, so one is, is this. This is a strongly connected component. Why can't it be bigger? How do you know I can't make it bigger? Yeah. Yeah, because if you think of this as one giant node, there's only stuff coming in. So there's no way to come out of it. Right, cool. Uh, what's another? What's another? Comp uh, another strongly connected component? Yeah. Okay, so there's a claim that this, these three, form a strongly connected component. Okay, that's true. Yes. So what's the last strongly connected component? Just UNCG by itself. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, well, we covered all of the all all the notes in the graph, so we should be done with them. But let's add another couple of graphs. So this would be another strongly connected component, right? Uh, for the rest of the lecture, we're going to ignore anything that's disconnected, completely disconnected. It's trivial to know that it's a separate component, right? But um, why might it be useful to know that these are strongly connected components? Yeah, most common occurrence, that's one possibility. Another thing is strongly com connected components are very natural ways to define communities, okay? So these websites kind of form a community because they are related to each other sort of mutually, right? These websites you can imagine form their own community as well. And then these websites are completely disconnected so they form their own community. So if you have a graph of relations, if you are interested in understanding, hey, are there different communities of people here or different communities of items, of objects, if you can find the strongly connected components, that's a very natural way to define groups in a graph that you can say, hey, I think this is a very tightly knit community. Because it means that from every node in that group, you can get to any other node and back. So they kind of like have some relationship with each other, right? 
And yeah, you guys are right. These are the three strongly connected components. So that's great. Hopefully guys, you guys were thinking about how you figured that out because the rest of this lecture is to write an algorithm to do it for us in the case where we have a graph that's too big, okay? And again, this algorithm is not trivial. So I actually don't expect you guys to figure it out, but we are gonna cover it. Cool. Um, in real life, it actually turns out that there's one giant strongly connected component. So if you look at the graph of the internet, it actually turns out there's one big giant connected component that has like 95% of all the websites because there's so many links between them. And then you have a bunch of little tendrils that extend out. It's a very interesting like visualization of the billions of websites that exist. Okay. okay, so strongly connected components tell you about communities. A lot of graph algorithms also rely on you being able to identify strongly connected components, okay? Sometimes we identify strongly connected components as the first step in more complex algorithms because it simplifies our graph structure once we've identified these components. This is an algorithm that we're gonna cover later in this class called two sat and three sat. It's a very interesting problem. You don't need to know what it is, but it relies on you first being able to identify strongly connected components. Okay, yeah. Oh yeah, this is uh, Boolean logic. Again, we're gonna review it when we cover it, but this symbol means or, this means and this means not. Um, yeah, cool. And then there's also a lot of applications of this in any graph that you imagine. So if you're looking at the graph of like predators and prey, you can imagine trying to identify strongly connected components, helps you identify communities in, in those animals, okay? Okay, so how do we find strongly connected components? Any ideas? Maybe look for cycles, okay. Other ideas? More ideas? Any suggestions? Yeah. Closely related. You're, you're, that's a good idea. You're sort of getting actually to the more advanced algorithm. Yeah. yeah. Look. You need to find all the pathways. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Allows you to go back to yourself. Okay. So those are all really good ideas, actually, if you guys keep expanding on them. So the most obvious idea that you guys should always try to come up with for any algorithm is the brute force solution. Okay. Which is, in this case, the most straightforward thing to do would be consider all possible ways that I can split the graph into pieces. And then for each way, check is each piece a strongly connected component, which means when I run DFS on that piece, it stays within that piece, right? So that is like the most brute force approach, okay? You guys were a little bit too smart, so you were already thinking of even better ways to do this. This is actually a very slow algorithm. Uh, how many ways are there to decompose a graph into strongly connected components? If you were to try this algorithm, like you should, if somebody mentions this to you, you would very quickly think about trying to implement it and you should be like, yeah, no, that's way too slow. Why? Yeah. Would you check every um, You're getting a little bit more clever, but if you have a graph with n nodes and you're trying to decompose it into subsets, the number of possible subsets is two to the n, okay? So uh, you guys don't necessarily need to know that. If you've taken any discrete data structures, this should be pretty straightforward to you, but all possible subsets of a set is two to the n, okay? So even if you could check if it's strongly connected in constant time to check all of the possible ones, you're already looking at exponential, right? So you would not try that. A second try is you could try something like this, which is what you guys were sort of getting at. You can run DFS a bunch to find out which U's and which V's connect to each other, right? If they connect to each other, then they're in the, in the same strongly connected component. So you could essentially, like you could imagine from each node, if I run DFS, it tells me 
who does that node reach? Who can that node go to, right? And then if I run DFS from every other node, then I'll essentially have these lists where for each node, I know these are all the nodes you can get to. And then for all the other nodes, I also know where they can get to. And then you can think about, well, maybe I can find the intersection of the nodes. You know, if you can get to like ABC and ABC each can also get to you, then they form part of a strongly connected component, right? Okay. Um, let's see. Let's skip this part. So this is the second solution that I was describing. It is not super important to know this because this solution is actually slow as well. Why? What is, if, if I give you this as the pseudocode, which is what I just described to you, why would you reject this as a possible solution to my problem? Yeah, that's great. It's at least 11 squared, okay? So even if you can do this part in constant time and this part in constant time, which you can't, running DFS is linear time, right? Then because you're looking at each node and then for each of those nodes, you're looking at every node that it can reach, which can be up to N and you're saying, okay, well, what nodes can you reach? You're at minimum gonna be doing N squared work, okay? Which is not great. So today, we will actually see a linear time algorithm, linear time in the size of the graph. Again, m could be n squared if you have a complete graph, right? But it'll be linear time in the graph. And this was discovered in 1978 by this guy called Kosa Raju. And it was rediscovered in the middle, mid 80s. So he was the first to propose it. He did not receive credit because it was not published. He didn't publish it. Somebody in the 80s published it. Um, but then eventually people figured out that he was actually one of the first to propose it. So it's an older algorithm, but it's still pretty recent, I would say. Like a lot of your parents might have been teenagers and this algorithm didn't exist when they were teenagers, right? All right. Oh, well, this is the guy. You guys excited to learn this algorithm for the next 10 minutes? Speed run, no, I'm kidding, no, no, no. We'll, we'll just finish covering it on Monday if we don't finish it today. All right, so let's say I tell you this. Um, let's run DFS starting at D. What does that look like? Yeah, it goes to E, goes to F, and then it's done, right? Okay, and then what do I keep doing? I run it in a node I haven't been to. So I run it here, all right? And then it goes from A to B to C, okay? Yeah. So whenever you have to um, go to another node that you can't do inside of the node you're starting at, but like for the situation where like, since you start that game, would you have to restart it at a different point? Yeah, 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 yeah. You restart. So the DFS, the idea is that you restart, and then each time you restart, you have a new tree. So that gives you the DFS forest that we talked about earlier, right? So actually, if you run it, if you run DFS, the first run gives you a strongly connected component, right? And then the second run gives you the other strongly connected component. And then that takes linear time because you're running, you're just running DFS on the graph, right? What are some issues with this approach? Yeah. You don't always know where to start, right? I told you start at D and then that happened to give you this one. But if you had started at C, for example, then DFS would go, you know, it would reach all of these and it would go to D and reach all of these, right? So you would only run it once so you wouldn't be able to tell what are the what 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 are the two components that are strongly connected, right? Yeah. And then it's like with the starting, so the thing with the starting would it still end at the end point? Um, so if we started with C and you do it alphabetically, you would go from C to A to B, then pop back, then pop back, 
Then you would go to D to E to F, then pop back, pop back, pop back, right? Yeah. But that will not help you identify the strongly connected components because you'll have just one tree, right? Whereas if you start with D, you actually get two trees, and each tree is a strongly connected component. So one of the big issues with this algorithm is uh, we don't know where to start. So if I tell you to start at a good place, then it turns out you can use DFS to, in linear time, identify a single strongly connected component, right? So here's the algorithm. First, run DFS to create a DFS forest. So it does not matter where you start. You just run DFS to create your DFS forest. You can choose your starting vertices any way you want. Okay. Keep track of the finish times. Okay. Reverse all the edges in the graph. So in your original graph, take all the edges and flip them. Okay. So again, this should not make sense to you because again, this was the research paper somebody had to write. So it's not obvious, but maybe if you think about it hard enough, you might see how it works. And we're going to try to walk through an example. Next step, reverse all the edges in the graph. Then do DFS again to create another DFS forest. However, this time, start with the nodes in reverse order of the finishing times that they had in the first DFS run. So you run it once to figure out finishing times. Then you reverse all the edges in your graph. Okay. Then you run it again. But the way you pick which node to start with is you start with the node that has the biggest finishing time. Okay. And then that will discover one connected component for you, guaranteed. And then you will start DFS again on the next available node that has the next biggest finish time. And that will discover your second connected component. Okay. That is the algorithm. The strongly connected components are all the trees in the second DFS forest. So every time you restart, you have discovered a new strongly connected component. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if we go back to the example, uh, actually, we're, we're going to walk through an example. So let's walk through an example, and it'll probably make sense to you. But this is the algorithm. Again, this does not necessarily need to make sense to you. But if you think about it and you try it a few times, um, it might, like, you might kind of see with a few examples why it works, but we're actually going to walk through why it works. Okay. And then what's uh, what's the running time? Who can explain the running time to me? Yeah. Oh, okay. What what would be the running time of this whole algorithm? How long does it take to do DFS? O of n plus m. How long does it take to reverse the edges in the graph? of m, because you have to reverse each one. Uh, how long does it take to do DFS again? OK. And then how long would it take to identify the different forests in the, in the, the different trees in the DFS forest? O of n, o of n plus m, yeah. You should you kind of get it for free, actually, depending on how you track your information. Whoa. OK, so you guys should not really understand why that works, OK? but um, we have five minutes, so let's see if we can get through an example. So here's an example, okay? This should try to give you a little bit of intuition. So what you should try when you learn a new algorithm and you don't understand why it works, you should try it on a few examples. And that might give you a little bit of intuition as to why it works. So here's the example we're going to use. This is our graph. And these are the strongly connected components, okay? We actually talked about this. But uh, we're not going to know them to start with, okay? So this is this graph we start. I promise you, if you try to do this, you can start with any node you want, OK? But the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with an arbitrary vertex, and we're going to do DFS. So I'm just going to say we're going to start an NCAT. You can start with any of them. It's going to work every time, OK? So from NCAT, I'm going to go to Wikipedia. So its start time is going to be 1. Then I'm going to go to the dog, cute little dog, start time 2. Then I'm going to go to Google, start time 3. Now I'm done with Google, so its finish time is going to be 4. I'm going to pop back up to the dog. Finish time is going to be five because I'm done with them. I'm going to pop back up to Wikipedia, and then I'm going to go to the New York Times. Start time six. 
pop out of New York Times because I'm done with them. So finish time seven, go back to Wikipedia, finish time eight, uh, go back to a and finish time nine. And then I will repeat DFS again because I can't reach UNCG at all. So I need to start at a new node. And it's start and finish time is going to be 11. So this is just run DFS, right? We've done this like three or four times at this point. So it should be very familiar to you. I just ran DFS and now I give you all the start and finish times. Okay, the next step in the algorithm is reverse all the edges. So I'm going to do that. So from here, I just flip them. Okay, I have now reversed all the edges in my graph. All right, you guys should maybe notice something. But now I'm going to do DFS again, but I'm going to start with the largest finish time. So which node do I start with? UNCG. Okay, and what do you notice about UNCG? It has no out edges. So I start with the UNCG and bam, it's its own connected component, right? What node do I start with next? You start with A&T because it has the next largest finish time, right? I think, yes. So I start with A&T and I'm gonna run DFS on this graph, right? I reverse the edges. So this time I'll go to New York Times, then I'll go to Wikipedia. And what do you notice at this point? You actually can't get out of this little circle anymore. So you're done, you're done, you're done. Pam gives me the second connected component, all right? And now, which do I start with? There's only two notes left, so who has the biggest finish time? You start with the dog. Dog goes to Google, and then dog is done. Bam, the last DFS tree. So those are my three strongly connected components. Okay. All right. It worked. I promise you, no matter how you do the starting one, it will always work. Okay. So you should be thinking to yourself, trying to see like, okay, what, why did it work? Why did it make sense? Does reversing the edges matter, right? These are the questions you wanna ask yourself if you were trying to figure out why this is working. We have a few more minutes. So, yeah, we'll start this and we'll finish it on Monday. But if you do want to really, again, oh my God, I don't know why this happens. If somebody knows why Google Slides keeps messing around with my arrows, please let me know. So anyway, um, I'll give you a hint, which is something you want to do to try to figure out why this always works, no matter what you do, is to actually pretend that each strongly connected component, it's its own vertex. So like we're going to ignore everything inside the strongly connected component, and we're going to make them what we call meta vertices. Okay. So this is just a thought experiment. We don't actually do this in the code. This is just to try to think, why does this work? Okay. So we have something that we call the strongly connected component graph, where each strongly connected component, we consider its own vertex, right? So ignore their stuff in here. This is just one vertex. This is one vertex. This is one vertex. And for the edges, if any of these nodes have an edge to any of these nodes, then I will draw an edge in my graph, okay? So that's how I'm getting the edges. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's 12.50. I will end lecture here and we will wrap this up on Monday, but I do encourage you to go back and maybe try to think, I think you have all the information you need to understand why the algorithm works. Again, if you were trying to come up with it on your own, that would be very difficult, but you know the algorithm and we walked through 20% of explaining why it always works. So you should try as an exercise to maybe figure out the rest of it on your own, okay? All right, everyone on Zoom, thanks for joining us and I will see you guys on Monday. All right, see you, Theron. And uh, yeah, you guys should remember on Zoom, uh, the midterm is next Friday. You need to be in person, okay? Just make plans to do that, all right? All right.